Today's episode of Socially Democratic is presented to you by Dunn Street. Dunn Street partners with businesses, organisations, unions and social democratic parties across the globe to develop community organising strategies and train leaders to build power from within their community. And in 2021, Dunn Street will continue to work with folks that want to share their stories, inspire others, take action, strategize, give hope and organise communities for change. To find out how you can partner with Dunn Street, hit us up at dunnstreet.com.au. Socially Democratic is also presented to you by Morris Blackburn Lawyers. Are you passionate about providing access to justice? Morris Blackburn, Australia's leading plaintiff law firm, is looking for an associate to join their employment and industrial law team on a full-time permanent basis. You will use your legal, technical knowledge and expertise to strive for fair outcomes for our clients. Uh, The role is based in sunny Melbourne, And to apply, go to morrisblackburn.com.au forward slash careers. Be part of change and fight for fair. Apply now. Hello. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Socially Democratic, your weekly centre-left politics and organising podcast that dives into the progressive campaigns and issues of the day and the people leading them from home and abroad. And on this week's episode, we are joined by... A uh, good friend of mine, Scott Connolly, who is the Assistant Secretary of the ACTU, the Australian Council of Trade Unions, the peak body that represents unions across this great southern land of ours. And they held their triannual congress, happens every three years, triannual, last week, uh, albeit online. And he'll come on today's show to talk to us about that, uh, as well as the role that the ACTU played in getting JobKeeper up last year, uh, what the government should be doing now to support Australian workers. And we'll talk about a whole bunch of other things, including the gig economy, um, some success stories for the union movement in terms of membership growth uh, and how to tackle big multinationals like Amazon. Uh, Also let you know that uh, speaking of Amazon, next week's episode is with Lawrence Ben, who is uh, the national uh, political director for the RW... DSU, which is the Retail, Wholesale and Department Store Union in the United States. Um, If you have been following the campaign to unionise and organise Amazon in the United States, you'll know that that union, the RWDSU, have been running uh, an election campaign or uh, an organising campaign in one of the Amazon warehouses in Bessemer, Alabama, just outside the uh, Montgomery, Alabama, sorry, no, just outside Birmingham, Alabama. Um, And Lawrence will be on next week's show to give us the lowdown on that entire campaign. It was unsuccessful. So uh, (laughs) not that that's a spoiler alert. I think we all know that. But in recent days, there's actually been some uh, news coming out of the the, uh, Labor board in the United States that has recommended that there needs to be a do-over, a re-election because of the conditions upon which the election was conducted. Uh, They've uh, they've come to the conclusion that it um, wasn't kosher. So they should do it in another election. So this story hasn't ended, basically. But we thought we'd get Lawrence on to talk us about the campaign and the ins and outs and all the shit tactics that the uh, company used against workers, intimidation to stop them from voting in support of the union. Uh, So check out that episode next week. Uh, Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify and Stitcher. And if you like the show, let us know by leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts or Podchaser. And for all updates about recent episodes follow us at dunn street as d-u-n-n-s-t-r-e-t on facebook twitter instagram and linkedin okay let's get to today's episode okay we're taping this one on a friday morning in lockdown melbourne again the sixth time covid it's like tony liberatore just can't seem to sh- shake that tag but uh to uh help us get through uh the next uh seven days of being locked down certainly here for us in victoria uh, we are joined by the assistant secretary of the australian council of trade unions and a good friend of mine scott Conley. welcome to socially democratic Fantastic uh, to be here, Stephen, and join uh, you and everyone here in uh, lockdown number six in, in Melbourne this morning. Um, 
we, you, you were due to have the, uh, the ACTU Congress last week. And first of all, congratulations to you, you and uh, your colleagues, uh, Sally, Michelle and Liam, on your uh, re-election to your respective uh, positions at the ACTU. Um, Congress was due to be held last week. It's usually a pretty big affair if anyone's ever been to one before. But obviously, because of uh, COVID, you had to shift it online. I'm very keen to get a sense of how, that, how, how the organisation managed that. Um, how often did you have to say, delegate, delegate, you're on mute. No, delegate, you're on mute. No, that button. Um, tell us, talk us through how you move such a big and such an important uh, event for the trade union movement here in Australia to, from being a, a face-to-face event to then an online uh, congress. Yeah, look, thanks, Stephen. Uh, thanks for taking me back there. I thought I'd um, you know, not have to think about Congress for a, a few years. But, um, look, yes, uh, it was particularly difficult, uh, of course, um, uh, to put the Congress on. Um, we'd, al- we'd already made the decision at the end of, um, end of last year to convene uh, Congress virtually. We had uh, pretty uh, pro- well-progressed plans uh, in place to ensure that... Um, the Congress could convene. We'd, we'd bring together a couple of thousand delegates as we normally would do uh, triannually uh, to uh, to uh, consider both the leadership of the movement, but also uh, more significantly its key policies and priorities for the next three years. Um, uh, just uh, just last week, so um, our best laid plans, uh, a pretty significant agenda, great um, uh, list of international speakers we'd managed to arrange. Uh, to come along and join us, many of the many of whom we'd pre-recorded and had scheduled uh, virtually, but unfortunately, the um, the last the extension of the restrictions in Victoria meant that uh, with about I think 48 hours I noticed we had to make um, additional plans to just make the practical decision that the logistics of convening multiple forums across multiple platforms and devices, uh, as well as facilitating the essential uh, democracy of um, the Congress in terms of delegates being able to cast votes, consider policies, move resolutions uh, in a a format um, that was already difficult, um, Mm -hmm. was just not possible to do with the certainty that we needed to be able to um, to take that proposition forward uh, to the movement. So um, we, with the support of the executive uh, and um, and uh, the key leaders in the movement made the decision to really just curtail uh, the Congress and to have it deal with um, the uh, the procedural matters it needs to deal with to ensure the functioning of the ACTU. We made an equally significant decision that all the policy matters will be considered by uh, the executive uh, in September, and there's already arrangements in place for that to, to convene. And hopefully, and we're very much looking forward to this, an opportunity for the movement to come together collectively um, at a special uh, ACTU Congress um, uh, towards, well, when we practically can. Um, and I think that's the key key question because we do want to provide an opportunity for the movement to gather, as it generally does um, and has historically done really since 1943. Um, uh, it's the only last uh, time we've held a special Congress, um, and that was obviously in wartime when it was convened to respond to the war effort. Uh, but every year, every um, two years and then three years since then, the Congress has convened have um, really been that effective workers' parliament for the working people of Australia through their unions. So it is a big thing. Um, uh, we managed to get through last week with a few more uh, uh, grey hairs and small challenges for uh, for a number of us. But um, you know, I think all in all, it was a success. And I, I think in terms of substantively, it wasn't um, a, a missed opportunity. I, I think of obviously you know, the reaffirmation of the leadership, the movement support for its leadership, you know, particularly. Uh, two fantastic women leaders uh, for the first time ever in Sally and Michelle uh, to have um, uh, them return to our, our leadership. Clearly, you know, I think they've done an outstanding job in terms of elevating the voice of working people in you know, very, very difficult times and ensuring that um, you know, unions are back uh, in the centre of the national debate about what um, is important uh, for our country and our economy and what's uh, critically important for working people. Uh, in uh, these particularly uh, trying times. So um, that wasn't lost and we made uh, uh, the movement's voice uh, heard uh, out of Congress, as we usually do, just not in the in the way and at the volume we would have um, uh, probably liked to, uh, but there's, there's lots more to do. And I think the movement, um, like, like I think the overwhelming majority of Australians has been very generous in terms of uh, patience and understanding in terms of 
um, how difficult these times are and how we do need to consider that um, everything can't always be as we uh, might hope and might imagine, but we still uh, have the important uh, work to do and that's ultimately uh, the priority at the moment, just making the difference, getting what needs to be done done uh, for working Australians. Picking up on that point you just mentioned before about the re-election of both uh, Sally uh, and Michelle and the the role that they have played in their very first term, and it's great to see that they've um, they've been re-endorsed by by the the wider union movement. Certainly during the the early days of um, the outbreak last year, um, and seeing uh, Sally leading the the trade union movement and the ACTU in that national conversation about how can uh, government from a policy standpoint uh, seek solutions for us to overcome or at least manage this outbreak whilst we try and find solutions because at that point we didn't even have vaccination. Um, and seeing Sally in the, the public domain and making a very, very strong case for working people, it actually felt like, I don't, I don't and no disrespect to previous leaders prior to that, but it was the first time I felt like the AC2 you were back in that national conversation and actually throwing their weight around for a very long for the first time for a very very long time i don't know if you got that sense as well how has the actu um found um it's uh how has it gone in terms of the relationships it's had both at a federal government level and at a state government level and getting to those 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 uh those rooms where decisions are made to ensure that they their voice is heard but also then their policies that you guys are coming up with are being enacted yeah so i think um you know there's a couple of parts to that uh stephen and i think you know the, the most obvious one is you know really um the caliber of leadership we have uh, in both um uh, sally and michelle and their particular capacity to cut through at so many levels and demand uh, our voice uh, be heard um in you know, not just, you know, the traditional forums, but, um, you know, wider community forums and the significant um, power that the ACTU has, not just institutional power as, a, as an important um, a body uh, representing working people in this country. That is and, you know, generally has been recognised by, by governments despite um, their political persuasion, but significantly and... and um, and, and really uh, powerfully in terms of our capacity to cut through into the community and, and reflect um, those priorities that workers, be they union members uh, or not, um, are feeling and giving voice to those concerns. So I think, you know, at the start of this sort of, if you look back to, you know, March, February, March last year, you know, the government, to its credit, did um, take an approach where um, they were extraordinary times. And, and did sort of think about this differently than they would have traditionally done, albeit um, reluctantly, I think, to be to be fair. It wasn't a, their natural response. I think there was a lot of hiding. There was a lot of denial. There was a lot of um, default uh, positioning. Let's go back to politicising this and how do we respond to this. But when it became very paramount and clear that this wasn't a, a normal event, that it was an extraordinary uh, set of circumstances, that it was a global uh, crisis, there was clearly a consensus that... Um, we needed a different response that um, the Australian people, I think, uh, again, made this very clear. And we picked, we picked this up in, in polling we were doing around uh, this time last year, that the expectation of the Australian community was not more of the same. There was an expectation that we all uh, put our shoulder to the wheel, that Team Australia tagline that sort of became popular at the time was not something that happened um, because it was leadership, um, overwhelmingly, it was coming through because that's what the community wanted and expected and made it clear, uh, you know, both um, in the things we were seeing, but equally conversations we were having. And the government um, responded to that and, and put in place um, you know, practical steps to ensure that you know, the COVID recovery, um, you know, the commission, the you know, consultations around workplace reform, uh, all were done in a way that they haven't been done um, historically for, for a very, very uh, long time. I think probably the last time a Labor held, a, held office federally, if not uh, further back, um, you know, frankly, in terms of how uh, all the parties um, contributed to uh, the response. Um, so that was very different, very different, you know, in terms of you know, someone sitting inside the ACTU and seeing those things and uh, being at those forums, we hadn't been exposed to that. And, yeah, by and large, that was reflected across all 
all um, all levels of government. You know, there was an extraordinary level of cooperation across the states. You know, particularly us. You know, being able to coordinate with state labor governments. You know, this institution of the national cabinet provided a significant point of leverage mm. uh, for working people to enable. Um, working voices uh, to be heard and priorities, and I think the story of uh, job keeper and job seeker is very much one of that. Um, that wasn't one there, one that was, um, yeah, led by the government. Yeah, they came to that uh, really kicking and streaming very reluctantly. Uh, but um, yeah, given their credit, they did make the decision at the end of the day. Um, we want them to do it again, um, absolutely, in terms of the significance of the crisis we're in now. Um, yeah, but that came about uh, because we were able to leverage. Um, uh, support across state and territory leaders um, and using the national cabinet mechanisms to establish a point where the government and employers, to their credit, um, you know, uh, provided one voice and one you know, clear uh, solution that made such a significant difference uh, through those uh, you know, six to, to seven months uh, in the middle of last year. Yeah, and that's, it's, I don't know, certainly in circles of uh, family and friends that aren't politically engaged all perceive that job uh, keeper was a policy initiative that came out of the Morrison government and it's a story that needs to be corrected and uh, here's a good opportunity for you to do that Talk, walk us through um, the 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 steps that the union movement and the ACTU took to, to, to come up with that idea and then actually start to make that happen and push that on government to, to take that initiative, that policy initiative, or embrace yeah, it. Yeah, look, absolutely. I think you know, for us, the, you know, we did a lot of work. Um, you know, at the start of you know, last year, you know, particularly looking to what the experience was, uh, both uh, in Europe and in the UK. And I think the furlough um, uh, initiative that that the you know, big unions in the UK, Unite particularly, has led um, and saw established. Uh, at, at you know, again, from an outsider, it looked like at the government's initiative and less contested, but it was very clear to us that. A direct wage subsidy tied to the employer was going to be uh, a point of difference that was required to ensure that we we um, maintained continuity, uh, responsiveness, and critically support for working people and and their employers to to enable themselves to recover. So we did a lot of work, both establishing the merits of the argument, drawing on international experience uh, directly uh, with governments and union leaders across uh, the globe, and being able to coordinate that and present that. Then, of course, it was a mobilising. Of um, of uh, additional voices uh, to support uh, our initiative, and particularly uh, our capacity to um, work with business in a way that we really haven't done in a very long time. Again, um, uh, to respond collaboratively, yeah, you know, the BCA in particular, yeah, you know, some of the other bigger employers, uh, all were significant uh, voices uh, that enabled us to, you know, incrementally uh, move uh, the government, who'd made it very clear. Uh, multiple times that a direct uh, subsidy um, tied tying workers and wages uh, to their employer was not something uh, they thought necessary or essential. But over the course of probably about um, that period between you know, March and, uh, and April, um, we were able to build the momentum and critical to that, of course, was you know, unfortunately the circumstances that we we're all confronting, the continuation of lockdown, um, the, the uh, impact of COVID across our communities and the devastation it was wreaking. The real tipping point, uh, there was two sort of critical moments that made made uh, this uh, the success that it has has been. And they were, of course, you know, that day when I think we all remember the massive queues at Centrelink mm. um, offices across the country, the movement's capacity to quickly um, respond to that, tell that story, um, I think every nightly news story led with uh, that that night. It didn't just lead with uh, the cues and the visuals. It led with stories of working people telling their stories and their frustrations of what that meant, their concerns, their anxieties. And that was our capacity to respond and tell that story. The next day, it was a conversation with, this can't continue. Critically, the BCA came out and lent its support. And I think later that, that week or on the weekend, we saw the announcement um, uh, of, uh, of JobKeeper in the first uh, its first iteration. Um, so, you know, circumstances, the capacity to respond, really that, you know, organising story about um, op opportunity, taking them, but also being being ready and responsive when um, when those present. And, of course, the collaboration with non-traditional allies around a common purpose um, really made those points of difference. And it's a huge piece of pu public policy. And to your point earlier on, you said, you know, you, you dragged the government kicking and screaming to uh, to 
uh, embrace this wave of uh, Team Australia that was coming from the community and put politics to one side. And it's something that I've... It's only I've started to think about recently with a couple of guests that we've had on the last couple of weeks is that, I mean, because March... Uh, April 2020 now feels like it was a decade ago. I keep on forgetting that there was that kind of national unity there at that moment um, between between Liberal and Labor governments, between obviously you know business and 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 the union movement and the community in general about we need to all pull together to get over to get over this. And there was that piece of unity. Fast forward to today, and I know that you guys are t- keen to try and get this JobKeeper 2.0 scheme up. I feel like as if the federal government have gone, you know what, it's just all too hard. Like, really, do we have to do all this again? I thought we just did that once last time and that would be enough. Is that your sense that you're getting from government right now? Look, I think it's, it's you yeah, know, at a number of levels, it's, it's really concerning what we're seeing now um, uh, in terms of both um, the tenacity and capacity of our leadership at, at that federal level uh, to respond to the crisis. I really do think, you know, we're seeing uh, a crisis in leadership where there isn't um, that real vision and that um, capacity to cut through and bring everybody together that, as part of that, the extension of this, we're sort of seeing a, a default position to, you know, the old politics, you know, blame gaming around who's responsible. It's either it's it's lockdown or it's vaccination sort of tit for tat daily in the press cycle between, you know, state leaders and the Commonwealth um, and no real cut through around um, what is the pathway out and, you know, the prospect that, the only response from you know, our, our uh, national leadership is that we've got to wait four or five months before we have any prospect of things returning um, to normality. Um, it's just um, a, a reflection, I think, of yeah, your point, yeah, but a real um, uh, challenge that they aren't able to uh, to meet, and and it, it's wearing yeah absolutely thin yeah, across. Um, you know, leadership institutions, the movement, but more significantly, you know, small business people across the country, you know, working people significantly across the country, um, are just sort of, you know, I think um, really, really struggling. Um, and that is um, indicative of, you know, just, you know, if you look through our experience with you know, this government, unfortunately, at every moment they're challenged, um, they've let us uh, down. This is one again. There was an exception, of course, you know, in the middle of you know, early last year, where we were all able to cut, come together and cut through. But we're not seeing that again, and yeah, that's um, that's a significant concern that there isn't another way. And I don't think that's that's um, that's the case at all, because there is multitudes of voices providing alternatives uh, about you know how we can actually get this done, how we can coordinate, how we can assist. You know, as one practical example, I know. We might get to this later on about you know, employer responses, but you know the the most um, obvious uh, way we can assist with rollout and and um, get facilitating uh, the vaccine uptake when it becomes available, of course, is using workplaces and using employers. And yeah, that's been a key suggestion of ours, I think, from um, from you know, probably this time last year about how that's leveraged, and it's only now getting on the table. Um, Albeit still reluctantly, um, you know, at a meeting less than I think a few weeks ago. Now again, you know, it's on the back burner, not a priority. And we're of course now seeing some fracturing happening uh, in that community where people are running out and doing their own thing because they're not prepared to wait anymore. Mm. And that's a, that's a significant concern about what that means in terms of responses, what that means in terms of speed of recovery, what that means in terms of the equity of what what happens on the other side of this, and how many people you know, get out, how many people don't get out, and who we're leaving behind. And that's um, yeah, you know, all things. I think that that's not consistent with you know the Team Australia approach. I don't think it's consistent with you know, our community's expectation, and nor is it consistent. I think with our capacity uh, to do uh, what um, is best for our country, you know, through this crisis. Well, let's talk about that. I mean, I'm keen to get an idea from you guys about where do you see uh, what do you want from government in response to, I guess, the two critical things that we're dealing with right now. Whilst we can't, whilst the we, we haven't reached that 80% vaccination levels and that's going to take some time, and even then I don't even know when the hell that's going to take because of the issue with supply, we're going to continue to have these rolling uh, lockdowns, which is going to impact on people who are working in, you know, um, part-time casual or industries that are impacted by this. 
what is the, what does the ACT you want to see from government to respond to these two critical issues that we're facing in the community? Yeah, look, it's very simple. You know, we need um, uh, you know, wage support you know, for working people. Like, absolutely, we should have a return to um, set of subsidies, not in dollar terms as we have now, and that's a good step. Yeah, absolutely, it's great to see the seven hundred and fifty back there as it was. Um, yeah, through JobKeeper last year. But yeah, we need it tied to the employer. It should be uh, the scheme uh, that it was. And I think there's an increasing a number of voices saying that that, um, that needs to be the case and the government's um, nothing more than ideological objection to that. Um, and yeah, recognition of their own failures with the, the way they did govern the scheme. I think there's a political sensitivity um, to it as well that drive it, that's driving some of their reluctance, but that's critical. And working people need to know that. Um, they have support when they need it, but also they, they don't have any incentive um, or any necessity to to incur and break and break um, the community requirements and restrictions that are in place. You know, taking away that economic imperative of people to have to go to work to put food on the table to pay their bills, and that's very much a continuing to drive uh, some of the the outbreaks we're seeing. And then, sort of further to that, practical um, you know, support is. The, the imperative for paid pandemic leave. Like there's just a no-brainer here that we need um, uh, mechanisms for people to be able to access a vaccination leave uh, through their workplaces should be supported uh, by the Commonwealth, um, where it has been supported by state governments. Um, it has made a significant uh, difference. Um, we've seen that in Victoria, uh, we've seen it in Queensland, and the capacity for uh, um, outbreaks to be managed, um, the communities to respond, um, uh, has made a, a significant uh, difference, contrast to what we're seeing uh, in particular parts of Sydney at the moment. Moving on to uh, other sort of matters that are, I'm, probably, I'm sure you're probably sick of talking about COVID. Um, I think we're all kind of, having, although having said that, I said this to a friend of mine the other day who's a researcher, I said, I think we're all sick of talking about COVID. And he said, well, actually, no. Everyone wants to talk about COVID. That's what everyone's talking about right now. And I was in a bar yesterday afternoon and I, before our premier told us that we we'll have to go <laughs> home, <laughs> and I could hear the couple behind me, and yeah, they were talking about vaccines. Are we going to get against Pfizer? Are you going to get, you know, AZ? It's dominating. <laughs> yeah, look, I think just to that point, I think it is. Yes, obviously, it's draining and all that, but I, I, equally, I think you know it's useful to sort of just reflect on just how significant this is and how significant yeah you know, these times are that we're. Yeah, we're living in, and yeah, your point about the Team Australia and yeah, the, the government's response like that, it, it's unheard of. Um, what's happened, um, what we're, what we've been able to achieve in so many ways, and I think you know, one one thing the movement doesn't do well is certainly celebrate its significance and its successes uh, as well as it should. Uh, but I think yeah, we should all you know, certainly uh, take a moment to pause and just reflect on how much we've achieved, how big a difference. Um, we've made and also be able to you know, learn uh, from this next time um, this happens. And I think, you know, there's that inking you know, feeling in the back of my mind that, you know, this um, is, is unlikely to be the last um, challenge that we're going to be confronted with and you know, take enormous strength from our capacity to respond and come together um, so successfully as we have done. I mean, and that's, a, that's you're right, Scott. And it, that makes me think about that. Like, it's, I don't understand why in... The example that we have had in the early part of this outbreak that we saw when, when community, business, government and unions or, or, or working people come together and use their resources and their their interests that can be uh, united around a common goal or a shared purpose to overcome this problem that we face, that we don't then continue to do that. Because obviously we're seeing new iterations of the same problem, right? This Delta variant uh, is a, a new iteration of that problem. If I was Morrison or any leader, that's what I'd be getting everyone back on the phone again. All right, everyone come back in again. How are we going to fix this one? You know, but it's it's like as if they've got exhaustion. Like they're going, ah, oh, we. Do they think this, that that was a one trick pony, or is it like I don't want to do that again? Or is he looking at it politically, saying oh, I look like I'm weak? I, you know, I, I can't get. Oh, look, I think it's the latter. I think unfortunately, it's a bit of the latter. It's a bit of you know ca capacity, and it's also a bit of an eye to the future. And sort of thinking through, well, what's on the other side of this? Um, who, who are my you know, stakeholders? Who's surviving this? Who's going to come out on the other side? And are they me, or are they are they with me, or are they not? And you know, I think on the current trajectory, you know, there's to be an enormous sense of you know comfort if you're sitting in that chair saying, well, at the end of this, um, it's going to be my Australia that you know 
uh, comes through this. And I think that's an appalling, um, you know, narrow, uh, you know, very um, insular view of what this country is and, and you know, the role and responsibility of the Prime Minister and how partisan um, this government is, how partisan this response um, has been uh, in so many ways. And I think, you know, for all of us that aren't part of that very, very small um, you know, cohort um, need to be challenged um, fundamentally uh, by that prospect and, and, uh, and doing uh, everything we can do to ensure that that's not the future of this country. But I think, um, you know, as, as a, I'm one that, you know, will spend the next, you know, 12 to 18 months, you know, determined to make sure that that isn't the case. And, you know, the entire movement will be um, you know, committed to ensuring that's not the case. Um, I think that's very much this contest. And, you know, if you look through to next May, when the next federal election, you know, falls due, um, you know, the prospect that things are turned around by then um, is probably the long strategy that I think the government's taking at the moment, a very narrow, very politically focused strategy um, that puts all of uh, our, our country's entire future at risk and, you know, more significantly, you know, so many families, so many communities, so many small businesses uh, to the wall just because they're not, um, you know, of that colour blue that, you know, this government particularly like. Mm. Yeah, live in Western Sydney or some part of uh, regional Queensland. Yeah. Um, to, to that point then, I was going to ask you this question a bit later on, but it's probably a useful time to bring it up. Um, I had your colleague on Liam O'Brien um, in on the show well, geez, was way back in 2019 and it wasn't long after the federal election and I asked him a question about the change the rules campaign and um, has the has the movement had an opportunity to sort of evaluate the the pluses and deltas and takeaways from that campaign and I think at the time he probably said look you know yeah we're looking into it it's probably a little bit too soon right now we need to get a lot of that data back um, but you know it's been three years almost now since then um, what are your reflections on on that campaign? The role that the that the ACTU can play, and I guess what we would call electoral organising, uh, organising uh, workers um, in the lead up to a federal or a state election. Um, and what are your thoughts going into this next election cycle at a federal level? How are you going to how, how we strategically approach this one? Is it more of the same? Yeah, so, or is it something yeah uh, look, I think, no, we know. We, I think we've got a clearer vision of a clearer line of, um, you know, what we could have done better um, with, with change to rules. And I think, you know, we, we um, much, much like our colleagues to some degree, had a very, you know, a big, you know, agenda significantly mobilised around that, what was needed to, to change our workplace relations in this country for working people and, and, and flip friends, flip, you know, a decade or so back to, to where it uh, needed to be in terms of bringing back some balance, both to the wage share of the economy, you know, productivity, workers' rights, you know, so, many, so many aspects of uh, yeah, our experience of Australians. So it was a big, a big battle and a big agenda. Um, and I think that's sort of one point that, that um, you know, hasn't been lost on us about its size uh, was an issue, no, no question about that, about... Um, uh, yeah, you know, and that that won't be the approach. You know, we're sort of taking forward um, in terms of uh, the next election in terms of that and ambition. I think you know another sort of you know uh, point is you know sort of how broad we were in terms of our ambition and our reach. And I think again um, some learnings around that sort of just fo refocusing us on um, you know what's required uh, you know, to win and equally playing to our strengths and, and sort of to pick up from those points. Of, you know. There's obviously a, a narrowness to this in terms of the electoral map um, that that will be taking forward into you know, how we allocate movements resources into next year, but then equally, um, you know, how we play to our strengths. And yeah, you know, for that, it's really a focus on you know, workplaces, a focus on you know, working people in their in their workplaces uh, that we're sort of are looking to prioritise, and you know, perhaps to some degree go back to a more traditional approach to. Um, to um, the movement's role in electoral politics, really mobilising um, where we're strong, mobilising workers as opposed to a bigger, um, you know, community and political pitch. Um, so there's sort of the elements I think that we've learned from and sort of reflected upon and equally the, the things we're sort of picking up as we start thinking about what our role is going forward. And it's one very much focused on 
what are the pros for workers in a very um, narrow sense and you have know, sort of the prelude to that, but there's no rocket science to this. I think, you know, what is you know, critical for working people, it's it's uh, about the issues of precarity, it's the issues of casualisation, it's the need for people to have security, um, job security, economic security, um, you know, for working people and their key priorities uh, that we'll be taking forward, um, you know, from workplaces into uh, the political debate um, uh, over the course of the next eight months or so. I want to talk uh, more about casualisation in a, in a moment, but just if I can sort of ask a more broader question about um, a couple of things in relation to, um, the, the, I guess, the pillar of in Australian industrial relations has always been the independent umpire and that the Fair Work Commission that changes its name as often as... Um, I can't think of other things that change their name a lot. Um, but uh, I had uh, the National Assistant Secretary of the SDA on a couple of weeks ago, Julia Fox, and we were talking about the Fair Work Commission. We were talking about the decisions that they've handed down recently uh, in terms of the annual wage review and also the ones that they did last year as well. And everyone looks at supermarket, work, supermarket workers as that cohort of essential workers during this crisis, right, because they, they're the people who help us put food on the table. Um, and we're lamenting the decisions by the Fair Work Commission in terms of delaying the wage increases to those particular workers and, and another other gr- group of other workers. I think hospitality workers as well might have come into that cohort. Um, and we're, I was questioning the role of the Fair Work Commission. And I don't want to undermine – I think that it's a unique and important um, uh, character of our industrial relations system is the independent umpire. I think the United States would kill for something like this. But I'm now starting to wonder how independent is that umpire? I just want to get your thoughts on the on the role of the commission and how it can be improved. Oh, look, it's um, it's a captured uh, you know, beast very much so at the moment. You know, after ten years of coalition government, every appointment uh, under this government to the commission has been um, has got progressively worse, frankly. And um, you know, I think really. Um, that's what we're seeing in terms of both the colour of the judgment, the level of independence uh, from the tribunal. And, you know, um, lots of things happen, of course, behind the scenes in terms of the battles that go go on within um, the, the tribunal that sort of make you very much, you know, um, thankful that it's coming up with, to some degree with the decisions it is because um, if there weren't people within there fighting um, it would be an awful lot worse uh, given some of the agendas that um, some of the protagonists I have that are sitting on those benches mm-hmm. and blatantly pursuing them. Um, that, of course, is you know, completely contrary to its role, uh, but one very much um, constructed uh, by this government, you know, by the appointments that have been made over the course of you know, their period in government now. And um, we're seeing that play out. Um, I think you know, the tribunal's decisions in relation to the minimum wage have been you know, very, very um, disappointing uh, last year, um, absolutely. But in preceding years, um, did make a significant difference. You know, it's bad, sort of back on track to some degree uh, this year, but, you know, it really um, picking up this point that Julia made, of course, um, is still taking a narrow view to to the economy and, and li- listening uh, far too much to some of the, the economic analysis as opposed to its more traditional role about um, reflecting balance um, in terms of outcomes across the community. So, yeah, I, I think um, going forward, it's a key thing in terms of its appointments. It's a key thing in terms of um, its independence, and you know, uh, um, absolutely um, part of our agenda for you know, Labor government, not one that we we sort of put on the top of the list. But you know, rebalancing the, the tribunal, reinvesting in its importance, and also. Yeah, Going back to its more traditional role, not just being, not just being um, a, a responsive a body that that meets the needs of the protagonists in the uh, in the workplace relations system, but one also that looks to its responsibilities going forward in terms of creating um, new new laws. And we've lost that as well. Like I think, you know, we could probably temper our frustration and anger with some of the decisions the tribunal is making if it was getting on with the job of advancing the rights of working people in this country, dealing with the issues that we're facing. The labour market is not the traditional labour market it was, but our industrial laws and our industrial systems are just not keeping up um, with the system. We are not, we've take, it's taken us, you know, over six or seven years to win um, um, domestic violence leave for working people using the mechanism of the, of the tribunal. Like, that's appalling. The the evidence is overwhelming that that is an, a, a right for working people that they should have 
um, it makes such a difference uh, to the lives of workers. And to have that dragged through the system for years and years and years, it's just appalling. The fact that you know workers in our, um, our uh, new parts of our economy don't have rights and can't have access to the tribunal, again, is appalling. And then to have judges give you traditional judgments that they don't they're not, um, they don't fit this prism of a worker. Um, it's just outrageous and just a slap in the face to a massive amount of workers in our economy. And, and we're seeing you know, this, you know, you've made the point about the, the US, how much they'd like our system. Well, one thing we definitely don't want is their system and their treatment of working people and the fact that there is classes of workers uh, in that country, um, an overwhelming majority of those that don't have rights. And we're unfortunately seeing that um, yeah, play out. Um, in how our tribunal's treating um, are far too many workers in our economy at the moment. Good time to talk about the gig economy. So obviously you sort of alluded to in your remarks there, um, you know, you and I are both former uh, organisers of the Transport Workers Unions is firmly in their, in their backyard. Um, it's, a, it's an industry that, are, that I assume is just growing rapidly. Um, must be super tough to organise, um, but... I would assume that the conditions that these workers are operating under are pretty poor and where there is tension and there is um, issues that there and problems that that is good things to organize around um what are the challenges that the movement's having in, in dealing with the gig economy uh, but where are some of this I, I know there have been recently some some small wins which is great because that's what you can build on talk talk us through some of those as well yeah look i think you know we're seeing um you know just your point how much growth there is here is just you know um it's really uh Exponential uh, is probably the word to describe it, and you know I think people's own experience of lockdowns is just accelerating. Um, you know these changes, um, and employers are quickly adapting at so many levels to the need to provide um, delivery services, um, uh, and doing so in u- utilizing non-traditional ways ways of work um, in terms of uh, technology-enabled uh, platforms of you know, Uber and you know, Uber Eats and you know a whole whole raft that Mdidi, I think, is now in our marketplace as well. So, you know, just a massive uh, growth of um, of the sector. And, you know, that's not going to stop. I, I think it's going to get more entrenched and clearly it's becoming a more entrenched, not just in transport, but in other forms of work as well. Uh, I think, you know, there's a growing uh, tendency for, you know, more traditional forms of work, you know, organised workplaces, offices are also looking to shift um and uh, use these sort of structures of you know, piece work, um, uh, um, platform-based work uh, to organise um, themselves going forward. So all of that's you know, concerning, uh, but in terms of our capacity to organise them, I think yeah, the positives of this is just technology is a negative, of course, in terms of um, it's easier for people to be denied rights, but then in so many other ways uh, for organisers, it's easier for us to bring people together. It's easier for us, us to form communities and ecosystems. And it's easy uh, for us in some degree uh, to respond and provide points of leverage. And, you know, I think using social media, using, um, uh, you know, the mechanisms out there that we have, you know, really successfully been able to do um, um, is providing the movement with capacity to really quickly uh, respond in non-traditional ways and bring uh, leverage uh, to some of these more traditional uh, employers and their blatant or fragrant disregard of the law. You know, just a, a case from this week has been you know, the decision in relation to McCain, where you know a social media campaign you know, played a key role in bringing those workers uh, some justice to an issue they were dealing with in their workplaces. Um, the campaign we've been running about um, uh, Harvey Norman and its um, outrageous abuse of job keeper laws again, bringing massive pressure pressure uh, to that employer um, on behalf of yeah those those working people people, and then yeah equally in terms of um, what um, unions are doing at a more granular level in terms of organising workers um, in the gig economy, particularly uh, in in Sydney and Melbourne to a lesser degree. The, the way that the Transport Workers Union and the Rideshare um, Association has been able to um, to build a community of drivers um, being prepared to stand up and organise. And uh, there's a, a class action being uh, launched, I think, just this week uh, on behalf of um, Rideshare uh, workers that's supported by the union um, to see uh, seek underpayment. It's an effectively uh, misclassification. The initiative that the TWU spearhead in relation to a menu log piloting um, an employment and a more traditional employment model 
uh, for its drivers uh, in the Sydney marketplace is a massive uh, victory. And globally, um, yeah, of course, we've had a, a judgment in the UK courts which have said um, that these platforms um, aren't, aren't, uh, cannot uh, be the mechanism to take away workers' rights and effectively uh, deeming uh, import drivers in the UK system as uh, notional employees under their employment uh, contract system. And you know, the Californian state, which again has uh, initiated legislation, which will see, um, uh, again, uh, rideshare drivers are deemed employees uh, for the state of California. So I think, and I think there's a similar initiative on the books in New York. So it's, it's trending uh, back our way. And I think that that's just a credit to um, the tenacity of uh, the movement and the strength of working people in these communities um, to come together and organise and, um, and make their case for, for justice and dignity in their workplaces. I want to ask you a question about union membership and growth. And I know that this, the narrative that's always been put out by the mainstream media is that it's in decline or at best it's in a holding pattern. But where are there examples of um, growth that you've seen for, for, uh, for union membership? Yeah, look, I think, you know, really... Yeah, this is never going to be as good as we'd like it to be in terms of the story of, of um, union density and union growth. But encouragingly, from our perspective, um, it is on an upward trend uh, at the moment. And yeah, that's uh, really encouraging in terms of both um, our proportion of, of uh, working people that are union members in this country. So that's sort of um, the highest it's been in a long time yeah, sitting at the ACTU in terms of our affiliation numbers. Um, particularly, you know, we're seeing that in in the, unsurprisingly, uh, the healthcare sector and the growth of um, you know, what's happening in the personal care services sector. Um, so that's you know, very encouraging. Um, equally, we're seeing um, a higher proportion of women members than we have um, ever before. I think the current stats are, it's about 60 plus percent of the movement is now women. And that's a very um, yeah, sort of encouraging uh, a figure as well. And we're also seeing um, a number of young people come to the movement. I think for our our, our sort of our own uh, initiatives here at the ACTU, we're seeing uh, uh, a very significant uptake of young people joining the movement. Um, uh, we're having enormous success using uh, TikTok, just as one example, in terms of a platform to connect uh, with young people and bring them uh, to the movement. And it, and a lot of um, sort of people, I think, has sort of dawned on them over the course of the last 12 months, 18 months, that. Um, there's so much of this that we're all in together to point about how we've been able to leverage our voice on a national level and drive that down into uh, workplaces and people's own lived experience of work over the course, using those platforms over the course of the last 12 months has, has been um, uh, sort of a lesson for us in terms of the intersection of um, uh, yeah, community messaging, you know, political organising, responding to a crisis, but also um, relevance in terms of um, um, union membership for working people in workplaces. And uh, we're sort of seeing that play out in all of those areas, as well as unions adapting and innovating, um, as challenging as um, you know, the environments uh, we're organising in is uh, at the moment. Um, unions have shown, like, like I think a lot of um, you know, social uh, organisations, extraordinary responsiveness and tenacity to just get on with the job of finding ways to organise people, finding ways of bringing people together. I think we've probably reached more people um, over the course of the last 12 months than we ever have reached. Certainly we've more, we've trained more people here at the ACTU than we've ever had before. We've had more people convene um, and come to meetings here than ever before um, and from um, so many more diverse areas. So the negatives sort of a, um, it's not the way we'd like to be doing business, but in terms of our capacity to be accessible, uh, to reach out to people and provide uh, the movement and, and what it does uh, for working people um, has sort of been um, uh, enabled uh, by the crisis. And, and um, I think, you know, unions have done an extraordinary job um, adapting and responding and being accessible uh, to workers in their time of need. And, you know, there's nothing new about that. You know, I think we're always stronger in times of crisis but I think we certainly are getting better at our capacity to respond and capitalise that and more focused on what it is that uh, working people need, um, but also what's important for unions uh, in terms of um, their capacity to respond and meet workers um, 
in terms of their needs in workplaces, and I think um, those things are sort of paying uh, dividends in what we're we're seeing in terms of growth. Um, the ASU, I think, is doing great jobs. Um, the SDA, I think, particularly as well, and I've mentioned sort of the healthcare unions uh, just doing an extraordinary amount of work. Um, of course, in terms of um, uh, that that crisis that they're very much on the front line of. Yeah, I mean, certainly. Talking to um, some of the, some of those unions you just mentioned, there, um, the partner with Dunn Street, the, their their experience has been that th- those workers that are frontline, what I would call frontline essential workers, um, during this crisis have turned to their union. That's been the experience they've got. If they weren't a member of the union, they sure as hell were by the end of it because they realised that they needed someone to actually represent them. And um, and that's uh, you know out of that sort of this what what this pandemic has been is a, is a horrific experience for a lot of a um, lot of people around the world. There is some positives to come out of it, and that certainly is for the union movement to get stronger and better and represent people. You mentioned before about when we talked about the United States and not wanting to see their system come over here. Uh, on next week's episode of Social Democratic, I'm interviewing uh, Lawrence Ben, who works for the retail, wholesale, and department store union in the United States, and he's going to come on and talk about their recent campaign to try and unionize uh, Amazon in Alabama. Um, I'm keen to get your thoughts on the experiences that we are having with Amazon and big multinational companies in the United States that are coming to Australia. Um, because as a young union organiser, I was always, the, the, as working for the, the SDA, we're always worried about Walmart coming over to Australia and bringing their industrial relations uh, norms to the Australian landscape. And that was always a great fear of ours. Uh, even Woolworths and Coles and that said, you don't want Walmart coming here because that's going to completely change the landscape of the relationship we have between employee and employer. Now we have Amazon here um, and I'm sure there are other companies like that that we're worried about. What's been the experience of trying to organise in a vehemently anti-union company but in a country where it's not, a, I guess, the, the relationship between employee and employer isn't as antagonistic as it is in the United States? Yeah, look, it's very, you know, it's challenging. And I think, um, yeah, we had Lawrence as, a, as, a, as one of our guests at Congress, so I'm looking forward to that conversation. Um, yeah, next week, you know, that's an extraordinary campaign, particularly that worked out at Bessemer, um, you know, and a great sort of story in terms of the movement's capacity to coordinate globally um, and, and and work at so many different levels in terms of applying pressure to a massive multinational, the Amazon campaign. Yeah, it's something that's been um, yeah going on for for a number of years and will continue. And I think the movement's very clear and very determined um, in its its focus on uh, not just um, addressing uh, the immediate issues uh, in those workplaces, which are uh, you know so stark and so appalling uh, in so many ways across um, uh, the Amazon uh, business, but also uh, its market power in a just a critical part of the economy. You mentioned uh, Coles and Woolworths and. You know, that retail consumption market is such a big part um, of the, the economy. Yeah. I know it, it's sort of just one, one small example. It's, you know, responsible for about 80% of the truck movements in this country, uh, retail truck movements um, across our national highways, all driven by those two, our two uh, major retailers. So just think about that extrapolated across so many other parts of uh, the consumption market. Um, it's massive. And to have uh, one provider... Um, Amazon, in this case globally, are dominating to such an extent is a very significant uh, concern and one that the movement globally has determined. I know that you know, the ITUC globally has made Amazon a key campaign and you know, um, we're determined to sort of uh, break up um, Amazon, I think ultimately is the agenda and I think um, uh, there's been some positive noises, again, responding to uh, the movement's voice uh, from uh, the Biden administration looking at um, that sort of aspect uh, over the course of uh, this this initial term but back to sort of practical organizing sort of how how, how we're doing it. it's really it's really hard in terms of amazon uh, initially the experience here was as as it sort of often is um uh sort of a gentle they are uh considered and and strategic i think in their approach initially to their entry into the australian market and came uh, making all the right noises uh, didn't really upset things started small but as they've grown over the course of the last two years, and it's probably just a little bit over two years now, they've had warehouses both in Sydney, uh, an operation in Brisbane, and they're expanding uh, in Melbourne. Um, we've seen an increase in, uh, well, 
a reversion to the more traditional uh, role uh, that we know of Amazon and the UW is just one example uh, in terms of uh, their organising probably the first union that saw some of those starker elements in the warehousing operations uh, down in, in Victoria. Um, and really it was just a playbook uh, that we'd seen played out in some of the Midwestern states in the US of uh, sweated labour, appalling rights, uh, Amazon time uh, being applied. Um, uh, which is, of course, uh, you know, effectively running uh, between tasks and running between uh, jobs and being timed and denied the most fundamental of um, of, uh, of rights, including our toilet breaks, uh, in people's uh, experience of, of work in some of those sheds, um, and the denial of people's access to their unions um, uh, and making it very hard for unions to access workplaces. But, um, you know, we have sort of, uh, again, picking up those points about adapting uh, been able to still uh, pick up um, those workplaces. The SDA's uh, been very successful in terms of representing our workers to date um, in difficult circumstances in, in Sydney, at the warehouse operations in Sydney. Um, they've organised uh, a couple of um, uh, pickets already um, so far. There was a day of action at Amazon um, just a few uh, weeks ago um, where uh, all the unions participated. It was globally coordinated. Um, in response to this. Um, so I think, you know, while it's tough, while the employers, um, you know, do in, inevitably, we think, uh, adapt their sort of global approach to management and very much run it out of um, their, their global operations, um, you know, we're able to sort of work through in traditional ways and force them to come, come to the table. And the key thing for us, I think, is sort of picking up, we, we, uh, can't do that on our own with these big global multinationals. The key thing is us coordinating our efforts with those global efforts, making ensuring that workers recognise that they're part of a bigger battle and a bigger struggle and a bigger fight, that we're not alone in this, that it is a global effort um, taking on these uh, big global monsters. And then using that strength and diversity of our organising capacity to apply that pressure uh, to uh, Amazon to force outcomes, be it at Bessemer, be it at you know, West Eastern Creek in, in Sydney or uh, Dandenong in Victoria. Um, that's our, our capacity uh, to respond and organise uh, globally against uh, against these multinationals and, and equally do it at, at all different all different levels. Um, I know that um, there was elements of uh, uh, coordinating shareholder resolutions at Amazon uh, globally that we've asked our super funds to assist with as well, and all these things uh, play play a part in terms of forcing um, a change uh, at Amazon. And there has been some positive steps, but still clearly, uh, given the results of this, there are so many uh, more steps to go before we can uh, achieve our objectives with um, that monster. Uh, yeah, a long way to go. Although I did read in the papers in the last two days that the um, the Labor Board in the United States has recommended that they do a redo of the uh, the ballot to unionise. So there's certainly this. I think that story's got some more um, some twists and turns in it. Scott Conley, thank you very much for your uh, time today coming on the show. Uh, before you wrap up, uh, I know that if there's anyone listening to the podcast that isn't a member of the, a union and I know that they're probably saying to themselves I don't think there is a union for my workplace and there is a union for a workplace there is a union for every workplace um, and if they want to find out what union they should join is there a hotline that they can call at the ACTU to speak to someone yeah look it's best to uh, go to our website which is just actu.org.au and um, yeah our team there will will help you but the web page is very efficient in terms of dealing with people's requests as a joint page uh, on there now, so it's a one-click join, and we'll um, we'll help you find your union uh, pretty pretty quickly. I think our turnaround these days is under 24 hours. So more than happy to help, and more than happy to take as many inquiries as as uh, as uh, you have. Fantastic! I've just shown how much of a Gen X person I've said. There. I said, "Is there a hotline?" <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Scott, great to see you again. Keep up the great work. Uh, like I said, congratulations to you and the team for your re-election. Another three years. Go out there and do great work for working people in this country, and hopefully, uh, we can change a government in um, whenever the hell the, the election will be. Always a pleasure, Stephen, and thanks, everyone. Hey there. Thanks for listening to Social Democratic. Did you like the podcast? Hit the follow or subscribe button and be sure to leave a review on Apple Podcasts or Podchaser. And to get all the latest updates on Socially Democratic, follow Dunn Street on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter and LinkedIn. And we'll see you next Friday.